people are either hyper focused on a diet, a therapeutic diet, or dissing it because they've worked with functional medicine providers, been on really restricted diets that were just a handout and couldn't maintain it. And so then they're like, forget this, right? Like that's my world that I'm sitting in. And so instead of looking at the diets, my thinking has really transitioned to what I call the three dietary principles as a starting point. And those principles are number one, Hey everyone, had a great conversation today with functional nutritionist Andrea Nakayama. She said something after we stopped recording that I wanted to repeat here, which is some people in her consulting practice are angry with functional medicine. And I get it. And a big part of that is because of the excessive amount of lab testing and expense that's being performed with markers and labs that are functional and theoretical and unfortunately, the field needs to grow further to weed out some of these tests that have not been shown to be beneficial or at least do so in more of a cautious manner where treatment decisions are not made exclusively based upon lab markers. So we discuss this concept in the bigger context of how listening to the person and their story should really be the primary data point that we use to steer diet, lifestyle, and treatment recommendations with a peppering in secondarily of lab tests. She talks about this narrative-based medicine approach, which I really enjoy, so we'll expand more upon that. Some of the most common diets she use or uses, how she helps people navigate if they're going more and more restrictive, but they're not feeling any better. We talk about thyroid testing and diet for thyroid and some of the tripwires that we can navigate successfully there. We also discuss the importance of symptom tracking. And uh, again, just a very, I think, fruitful conversation in terms of if you've been trying to improve your health, you feel like you're floundering a little bit, you maybe have gotten a few diagnoses or diagnoses that felt off. How can we sort of course correct and start listening more so to you Quantifying your personal non-lab data, like your symptoms and your history, onset, response to prior treatments, and make these things the primary indicators that help us figure out how to improve your health as quickly as we can, while also not leading you to have this really negative expectation because you've been rendered a number of theoretical diagnoses. So in any case, a really, in my view, wonderful conversation with Andrea Nakayama and I hope you enjoy it as much as I did. Andrea Nakayama, welcome back to the show. Thank you, I'm so excited to be with you. It's been a little while, so I wanted to start by just asking you, over the past few years, what have you been up to? Yeah, so the Functional Nutrition Alliance, the company I founded and the school, the program, Full Body Systems, my training for uh, counselors for functional nutrition counselors is growing and we're training, you know, nearly 3000 practitioners a year. So all sorts of people from all different healthcare backgrounds, whether they're emerging or they are in the field wanting to add systems thinking and functional nutrition to their practices. That is a huge opportunity. And I feel so grateful to be doing that work. At the same time, I'm really recognizing where there are a lot of gaps in in functional medicine and functional nutrition and the emergence of the field. And so I've really uh, taken a deep dive into the practices of narrative medicine and have been doing a lot more writing on my personal website regarding um, where we dive into the, the uh, qualitative information about our own patient experiences. Love it. And it's funny, we tend to be on the same page. I know historically regarding lab tests, sort of yes. picking and choosing and being careful, we're definitely on that same page. And with narrative-based medicine and sort of tracking subjectives, this is something that we've been queuing in on of late also. Can you maybe define how you mean and what exactly narrative medicine? For someone who's new to it, I think I generally understand what you mean, but let's unpack that. Yeah, it's a lot to unpack. And I just recently wrote an article about it on my personal website, andreanakiyama.com, my perspective on narrative medicine, because there's a lot of different meanings out there. 
But I just want to say that in functional practices, the way I've defined the different areas we look at as is as the story, the soup, and the skill. And the soup is the systems biology that a lot of us like to get fixated on. And the skill is the practices that we engage in, in relation to sleep and relaxation, exercise and movement, nutrition and hydration. The functional nutrition matrix, which is my iteration of the functional medicine matrix, shows those different areas. So we talk about the soup, the systems biology, we talk about the skills, the things we do, but I think those ATMs in functional medicine, the antecedents the triggers and the mediators often get overlooked in favor of the other areas. So as I started to explore, wait a minute, where is this sitting in the healthcare picture? That led me down many different paths that ultimately led me to the practice and study of narrative medicine. So narrative medicine is a, an emerging field. It stems out of the work of Dr. Rita Sharon, who is a physician and a literary professor, and she teaches the narrative medicine program at Columbia University, which is a very academic and pedagogical field. It's only 20-something years old. And it really, in its simplicity, is about teaching providers empathy. That Those are my words. It's really using the humanities to remind us of the human in front of us. And what I'm most interested in is taking those practices and transferring them to the patient. How can we, as patients pause and reflect and gather more of our own personal evidence so that we're better partners in our provider care, in our therapeutic partnerships, but also for ourselves, not constantly trying to fix our broken selves or seek some quick fix or solution without even knowing why, or even self-diagnose, self-prescribe, self-test, but pause and self-reflect. So for me, narrative medicine is an opportunity to train us as patients to slow down, gather the correct information before we rush into action. Love it. Yeah, I mean, I fully agree, probably not surprising. And I do think, and, and certainly over the past maybe year, we, we've really put more emphasis on the data gathering at the start being even more important. Yes. Because, you know, sometimes I think patients they'll get frustrated if the clinician doesn't hit a home run right out of the gate. And of course, all clinicians, we want that home run. It's almost like a surfer who had a really good ride and you just keep pursuing that high because it feels so good to have a good ride on a wave. And it feels so amazing when someone's suffering. In 30 days, the person comes back and says, doc, I'm feeling so much better. That is one of the best, most fulfilling feelings imaginable. It's super addicting. Yes. Um, but that would be sort of, if we're looking at a, a Gaussian curve distribution, that would be at one of the tails, right? It's not the meat of the bell curve. And part of that is because the body can be elusive. So many different entities, IBS, SIBO, candida, leaky gut, just to name a few examples, have a tremendous symptomatic overlap. So it's possible that what you were interpreting as, let's say, candida, was actually something else. And you don't know that until you start working into the clinical process and saying, gosh, that, you know, things aren't going the way that they should, and then you rejigger the plan. Um, so I guess there's, there's two comments there. You know, one, I totally agree, and it's super important to get the most accurate data out of the gate. Then for patients, it's important, like I've said so many times in the podcast in the past, give your provider some time, because yes. as much as your provider's trying to get there quickly, if you don't do the right thing, that's actually data that helps you through process of elimination get closer to the, the right thing next. Yeah, there's three things I want to say to that. One is we're applying acute care philosophy to chronic care. And you and I work in the realm of chronic care. And acute care is a fix or a protocol for what's going on. And in chronic care, we have to untangle that crazy web of interconnections that's happening. The other thing I want to say is one of the ways that I teach providers is what I call the art of the practice. And art stands for assess, recommend, track, repeat. 
And we have to do very thorough assessments before we make any recommendations. And a lot of providers are making recommendations that go back to that acute care model. They're making recommendations based on a diagnosis, which is assuming a lot when we're talking about chronic care. So we have to slow down, do those deep assessments, make slow and progressive recommendations. The last model I just want to think about in relation to what you're saying is um, understanding that the road from A to B is never a straight line. So when we go from A to B and we're looking at chronic care and getting those clinical results, it's going to be an up and a down. However, our level of excellence and understanding gets narrower and more refined as we go. And if we enter into that therapeutic partnership and that hero's journey with the patient being the hero and us as the providers being the guide, not the God, but the guide, then we are allowing that process of the up and down and learning from the up and down, not getting as practitioners triggered in our egos because of those downs, but saying everything that occurs is another clue for me. And this is where testing comes in too. It's all just clues. There's no definitive information when we're outside of the realm of acute diagnoses. Yeah, yeah. Uh, again, agree with everything that you said. And also one of the reasons why I will recommend that when a patient's looking for a provider of, of whatever training and, and uh, focus and philosophy, those who are very confident, in my mind, my opinion, is a red flag. Because you have to be a little bit unsure because that tells you that you're not putting all of your eggs in one diagnostic basket. And we, exactly. we see this actually come from, and it's funny, some of the, the big names, let's say, in SIBO research seem to really only think that it's SIBO. And this is something we've been seeing more cases at the clinic of late from some of the big SIBO research hospitals, which do amazing work in quantifying certain mechanisms and pathways. But the challenge with that can be is that it's a very, very reductionistic view on one thing. And sometimes what a patient doesn't need is going deeper and deeper and deeper into SIBO. And the real travesty about that in my mind is people will be told, oh, well, you know, this has got to be a really recalcitrant advanced case if they're not responding. And so now they start to inculcate this, this mentality of, oh, boy, I'm really sick. And for sure, some people that might be the case, there might be some really obscure, hard to diagnose anatomical abnormality is one example. But I would argue it's probably more common that there's something else that's been overlooked. And that's, and that's why we all have to work together. But I would say to a patient, just be cautious if, if your healthcare provider just seems really confident about a certain thing. And the, the real travesty about that also is the people who are confident tend to be the best at messaging, right? You, especially if we're talking about modern day, small snippets on Instagram, it's a short thing like SIBO causes all the problems with the data is in, we know this is clear. And it can be compelling when you're sick to look at that thought leader who just seems like they've really got it all figured out. But that that's really sort of a catch 22 because oftentimes they're going to shoehorn you into a certain condition. Yes. And then you're down that sympathetic dominant fight or flight seeking the answer for that and yeah. over identifying with that diagnosis. Yes. When, if we actually clear the muddy waters, we might do better to seek more clearly what's happening. And I love how you speak about this in relation to histamine intolerance. And you did on my podcast and you have in several locations I think it's brilliant that we can look at a branch, what is a downstream diagnosis that people over-index and fixate on and over-identify with when something more simple could get us to the resolution. And I always call it the simplicity on the other side of complexity so that we can understand the complexity of the physiology, but that the way to get to resolution may be more simple than you think. We may be overcomplicating it. And I think that this is a result of the noise in the media, but it's also the direction that a lot of functional practitioners have gone in over-identifying with a supplement, a test, 
that doesn't have a lot of evidence behind it and or a diagnosis. And so this is where I feel like we've lost our way as patients, just to get back to that piece. And we're not actually anchoring on the information and the expertise that we have, which is our own experiences, our own lives. And that's where we are the only expert in the room. If I come to see you and your clinic, I'm the only one who has expertise in me. And it's my job to bring you that expertise. However, I'm often bringing my expectations about what's been previously diagnosed, what I've self-diagnosed, what I'm taking, what I'm tracking through various resources, and I'm clouding the room with that information instead of the most important information, which is my timeline yep. and my experience. Yep. And that's why it's really helpful for the provider to be able to filter through some of that noise. Correct. We just had this come up in one of our, we do a monthly clinical training meeting with all the doctors in the office. And um, one of the newer doctors was going through how he was troubleshooting someone who really needed to kind of vent. And I understand for all the patients out there, and I've, I've been there too, totally. it feels good to vent. But what can happen if you don't take a moment, and I would recommend doing this before a follow-up, take a moment. Take some notes. Like when I was on the other side, I might spend an hour before a follow-up visit mapping out all my notes and then saying, how can I take this three pages and make it half a page? Correct. And there's a lot of value in that because cl you know, clinicians are humans and humans can be overwhelmed by a ton of context and they're trying to find that, that signal amidst the noise. And for patients, please understand that if you have confidence in your healthcare provider, if they're doing that, if they're trying to sort of filter down, it's not that they don't care about listening to you. It's they're trying to get through all of the branches, so to speak, of, of yes. the noise and get down into the signal of what's really driving your symptoms. Yeah. And I think that uh, I just want to give like two tips that I like to give to patients to help do exactly what you're saying. And one of them, and I don't know how you feel about this, but I really like to have patients differentiate between their signs and their symptoms. So what is it that could be measured by their provider? So they're talking about what could be seen or measured, a rash or a fever, versus what they're feeling and what they're experiencing that can't be measured. So if we separate that from to begin with and we talk about our signs, so we're speaking more in the provider's language, then we can go deeper into those things instead of the conflation that happens between signs yeah. and symptoms. Because a doctor's parsing out, can I get a data point for that versus let me listen to you now, okay? So those two things are one way in which I would have people prepare. Yeah. The other thing I love to ask people to do is to micro-timeline. And micro-timelining is taking one symptom and looking back in time so you can see what your triggers are and when you first remember experiencing that. So I'm a huge fan of timelining. And micro-timelining means I'm going to tell you, Dr. Ruscio, I've never been able to sleep. And then I want to say, okay, when was the first time you remember not sleeping well? Well, it was in my childhood when, right? Like, how do we micro timeline, recognize what makes it better, what makes it worse? There's a lot of clues in that micro timelining that help direct us as providers, but also become that narrative, that detailed narrative as a patient that might help us direct our next steps instead of saying sleep oh, I need melatonin or I need CBD or we're fixing sleep. What is it we're actually, are we solving the wrong problem? And I think that's what's happening a lot of the time. Yeah. And luckily I don't have problems with sleep. So <laughs> non-negotiable, got that one down. I, I think sleep is a great example because that is very often indirect. Sure, yes. if someone's saying, well, you know, when I get out of work at five, I like to have a coffee. So, okay, obviously, if you're having a caffeinated drink at five, right. there's your problem. Or yes. if I'm highly stimulated before I go to bed, I'm working out at nine o'clock and trying to go to bed exactly. at 1030. But I, I think with the people we deal with and, and we try to help, they know these things for the most yes. part. So sure, it's a screening thing that we look at, but much more often it's something like histamine intolerance, leaky gut. Uh, of late, we've really been looking at vector-borne infections and how they can impact things like the autonomic nervous system. So you know, Babesia and Bartonella are fairly well known to be able to do this, especially Babesia. Um, yeah, and you know something else that I know we'll come to in more detail a little later 
is these quantifiable symptom inventories where now we can get a sense for what's your total fungal score and is that better than your last visit and so that can be a really helpful snapshot coming back to filtering the noise if there's all this emotionality about the symptoms that are still present yet there's clearly a drop in those symptoms that's when we take a step back and say I get it. I hear you. I'm with you. I know it's unpleasant, but look at the progress that we've made in only 30 days or 60 days. So I think we're on the right track. We'll keep working the problem, but we do want to know, in my view, at each visit, do we pivot or do we continue down the same avenue of care that we're on? And that's one of the most important things, I think, at the end of each visit, the doctor, the clinician is trying to assess, right? Do we continue yes. with this line of treatment or are we going down the wrong avenue and we should pivot to something else? Yeah, I mean, when you say that, I think about my late husband, right? He had a glioblastoma. He died over 23 years ago now, 22 years ago mm. now. But mm. I remember with him and his sort of notion, and this is before I was uh, in the field, I wasn't a healthcare provider, but I was starting to see the impacts of nutrition on a chronic case and helping somebody not address their cancer, but address the terrain in which their cancer exists and the terrain in which interventions are going. So that was sort of my boot camp in this field. And I remember how nervous I would get for every brain scan. So every time he had a scan, I would get super nervous about what it was going to tell us. And he was super even keeled about it. And he would tell me, it's just a sign in the road. Anything we get, it's a sign in the road. And so to calm my nerves, and I was pregnant at the time, so he was taking care of me as much as I was taking care of him, he was saying to me, okay, before this scan, let's think about if the road goes one way, if it goes the other way, or if it stayed the same. Like, what will we do so you can feel prepared? And that really set me up for, in a dire situation, how we navigate each of those next steps without running away with it. And I don't know about you, but one of the things that I experience is that between visits, a lot of us as patients start um, interfering with the scientific method because we start changing things on our own or adding things yeah. in, or I saw that supplement, or I'm going to do this, or, oh, there was work was really stressful. And so I think we have to realize as patients that sometimes working with our provider or even working on our own, stay on a track and see what you can learn from it before you start throwing other agents into the mix that confuse the entire higher conversation of yeah. what to do next. Where are we at that sign in the road? Yeah. Try to maintain a macro view. You're, I yes. couldn't agree more again, because it's so easy to have a bump in the road and then say, well, you know, I think yesterday was bad because I didn't do this or I did that. And so I'm going to change. And then what the clinician's trying to do between visits is set up an experiment and Correct. then read read your body. We say in the clinic, your body is boss. So we're going to really yes. listen to those signals. But if you've gone from one hypothetical treatment approach and then you've made it three over the yes. past four weeks, we really don't have any useful data. I mean, sure, people do want to listen to their intuition, but I would say when in doubt, don't change anything. Yes. Unless it's super, super obvious that there's an overt problem. Yeah, or something that you've been prescribed or recommended isn't working in some way, right. then you reach out, right? But otherwise, like, we've left the scientific method behind. <laughs> We're no longer yeah. in a controlled environment. We never sure. are. I mean, that's the complexity of the human body. We're never in a controlled environment. We're not in a lab. But we have to recognize that there are a lot of life variables. And then where do we introduce or not introduce additional variables that could confuse the clinical journey? That, a, that road from A to B becomes even more confusing. And by the way, if this has been helpful, please comment and subscribe. This really does help us reach more people who are trying to improve their health. So it, it is uh, quite deeply appreciated. Maybe pivoting for a second, what are some of the most common things that you see? Because I'm sure people, you know, this is one of the challenges with the, the plenty of information on the internet. If you Google your symptoms, you can get cancer on the one side. This is more like your WebMD sort of results. And then you can get any variety of toxins, mold, inflammation, leaky gut, adrenals on totally. the other. So it, I think it's helpful to know 
what of those hypotheses tend to be more common? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Is there a handful that you think people should really put more toward the top of said list? Yeah, so I'm going to go into scope here, which is different than your scope, so aligned but different. And as a functional nutrition counselor, I'm looking at all of those things that you're talking about, or as a functional medicine nutritionist, as branches. Those are branches. They become part of the picture that I'm mapping, whether you receive a diagnosis or you have symptoms. Even though, you know, my expertise is in autoimmunity, particularly Hashimoto's, I've trained practitioners in Hashimoto's with other leaders in the field. It's not in my scope to say you have Hashimoto's. I can say you have autoimmune antibodies to your thyroid, and I can tell whether it's primary or secondary, but not in my scope to diagnose. So for me, all of those things you mentioned are branches on the tree, and I'm coming down to the roots, and not just the roots, but the soil. And in my three roots, many branches model that I teach into and I try to teach uh, patients to also understand any sign, symptom, or diagnosis you can name is a branch. We're going to look at the three roots, genes, digestion, and inflammation. And each of those roots has a circle of influence. And the circle of influence is a principle that Stephen Covey really introduced in relation to, you know, the habits of the most successful people. And it helps us to keep our focus. So when we're too narrow, like we were talking about earlier, we lose opportunities. And when we're too wide and it's everything under the sun, we're anxious. So the circle of influence helps us to direct our attention. So the genes, digestion, and inflammation all have their circles of influence, which are going to be where I focus my attention. And it's sort of like a spinning wheel of where I go with each person. This allows us to clear the muddy waters and prepare someone for the work that they might be doing with their physician that is at a different scope and might be bringing in more of the diagnoses and prescriptions that are out of my realm. But a lot of times what I see, even with the kind of patients that we both see, is that they're skipping a lot of these phases in favor of a targeted approach with the branch, as opposed to addressing that same branch through the soil and the roots. So they're missing the opportunity to take another way. And there's two ways to solve a math problem. And or more, right? So I'm not just looking at the one way in which is in medicine what we do with a more targeted approach. So I just wanted to state that um, in terms of the diagnostics. And this is, I would say, the hardest thing for me to teach providers who are studying to be functional nutrition counselors because we live in a very, I call it tier three dismantle the dysfunction, target the diagnosis culture. And so mm. I'm not here to say your work over my work. I'm here to say your work and my work, no matter who the physician is. Yeah. And I think well, that's let's really Let's double click key. on that really, yeah. really quick, because yeah. the more I've been thinking about this, I suspect the degree of why we are there in this yeah. functional model that's kind of reductionistic yes. is due to influence from lab companies and supplement companies. And it's it's really incumbent upon the clinicians. And I'm, I'm hoping, and it does seem to be shifting, that the newer generation of functional medicine clinicians and doctors, they're taking a step back and realizing, oh, this field isn't pure as snow. You know, it's a little bit tainted. And we need that that funding from lab companies and supplement companies to help make this all work. But the clinician needs to be kind of the gatekeeper of, well, I went to this weekend seminar and there was a lot of sponsorship by labs and it leaked its way into the didactic over the weekend. But I'm going to assume that not all of these tests have equal merit and therefore we don't need to be pursuing direct treatment of a diagnosis. Are, are you sort of sensing the same thing has happened? Oh, a thousand percent. I mean, yeah. you and I can both get on our soapboxes about this. And <laughs> I really go back to the fundamental principles of functional medicine as what I am 
really serving. And those fundamental mm -hmm. principles are the therapeutic partnership, which goes back to what you said, the body is boss. And what I'm saying that the expert in the room about you is you, the patient. So therapeutic right. partnership, looking for the roots, which means we ask, why is this happening? Not just what do I do about it? And a systems-based approach, which means we embrace systems biology and also systems thinking. And we become very reductionistic, to use your words, and really just targeting the, uh, the thing that we're saying is the problem. Even if it's a fungal or microbial imbalance, that isn't the problem. That's the problem out of context. And right. I see my job is to put that information as a clue into context. Do I need that clue right now or not? Do I know enough by hearing your symptoms and being with you that there's an imbalance in your microbiome and that there's likely gut hyperpermeability? Absolutely. I don't need to test for that to do the work to determine where I might need to go next. And so I feel like practitioners are over-indexing not only on these diagnoses, like those you mentioned, mold, SIBO, but also on these tests that don't tell us any, they don't tell us a diagnostic. They give us a little more information about the context, which we probably already know. What are some of the most common diets that you use and you find helpful? I'm sure for people in the audience, autoimmunity is something, especially with the discussions we've had on the podcast regarding thyroid autoimmunity, that this comes up a lot for you. So is there a few diets that you think have the most merit? Yeah, I think that, I mean, I have to say that in the world of nutrition today, it's kind of a dirty word, right? Like there's a lot of anti-diet theories and, you know, body positivity conversations. And so navigating in the world of nutrition where either people are either hyper-focused on a diet, a therapeutic diet, or dissing it because they've worked with functional medicine providers, been on really restricted diets that were just a handout and couldn't maintain it. And so then they're like, forget this, right? Like that's my world that I'm sitting in. And so instead of looking at the diets my thinking has really transitioned to what I call the three dietary principles as a starting point that allows us to bring in and then determine where we have to remove, right? We may need to mm -hmm. clear something, a food, a microbial imbalance, a negative mindset. There's things that in that circle of influence around inflammation, we may need to clear but how do we start to think through these principles? And those principles are number one, fat, fiber, protein at every meal. And first, helping people understand if they even know what those nutrients are, those macronutrients, and which ones are going to serve them, and being able to tune in to how those make them feel. And that ultimately serves the non-negotiable of blood sugar balance. Number two is eat the rainbow. And in doing so, we get more of that fiber. We get a lot of nutrients and phytonutrients. We can really see how we're repleting a lot of what might be deficient in the body. And number three is knowing your yes, no, maybe list. And this is work I love doing with patients because it really helps us to understand their relationship to food and to dietary change before we even dive in. So yes, might be foods that you know make you feel great or that you are you love so much that you're like, I don't want to give that up. And that tells me a lot. No is the world where you and I might live, where people come in with such a long list of no's and only a few yeses. And what they're not doing is the internal healing. So they're just removing, removing, and removing and trying to control through food. And the maybe is, I'm not sure. I don't know. And in functional medicine, this is the world of the mediators. So we're bringing people into a realm of understanding what works for me and what doesn't. So I start there. If we need to go to a therapeutic diet, we will go there, whether it's low FODMAP or a low histamine, depending on the case and the individual. But those diets are meant to be done, in my opinion, for a short period of time because they can also introduce new nutrient deficiencies that lead to new signs and symptoms. And then we're on this habit trail of chasing through diets. So sure. I prefer for the diet to be as vast as it can be 
for that individual at that point in time. How do you handle the person who seems to be stuck in a pattern of assuming that foods are causing all their symptoms, but there's not, and maybe they don't know this until you probe in and sort of Socratically help them realize it, but that there's no clear correlation. And then how do you help sort of, I guess, one, help them identify that you're going more and more restrictive, yet you're not getting any better. So let's maybe reappraise the need to go more restrictive and lead them sort of, because it's easier said than done, right? So how do you lead them to have the confidence that they can broaden things out without them feeling like you're not listening to them or you're just kind of trying to push them into expansion? Yeah. And this goes back to so much of what we talked about, about in that journey, that road to A to B and trusting your provider. In this case, I would say a person in this situation A, the internal healing hasn't been done. The body is not meant to eat that restrictive of a diet. So what's going on in there? Why can this person not receive the foods that they're trying to eat and what's happening when they do? And we might need to do some tremendous tracking to do that. I also hear in a situation like this, a lot of distrust with their own body. And Mm. I want to understand what it is that's happening that's led to this situation of restriction and restriction and restriction. And it tends to be some sort of control, oftentimes in a situation like this, around symptoms. Like, I notice if I took this out, it was better. And then it just becomes this never-ending cycle. I've seen this a lot in patients like with interstitial cystitis something that's hard to diagnose, that causes a lot of pain and a lot of daily disturbance. And then we have to rebuild nutrition and trust with the body because the body can't heal in that depleted state. And when I talk Mm. about the circle of influence for inflammation, for me, that's clear, calm, enhance, and modulate in relation to the immune system And again, we have to clear and calm. The body cannot heal in a fight or flight or in a depleted situation. And so helping them to understand that what they're doing, although they're trying to control their symptoms, is actually not supporting and how we dive into that conversation and respect what they've experienced and that what's worked for them has served them to a point, but We're at an impasse. So I think it's very delicate. And for me, this is where the beauty of the narrative comes in, because there's a story there. And, you know, there is some data. It's more mechanistic and in vitro, but some studies have taken blood samples from patients who were depressed and high stress compared to healthy controls, given both groups an injection into their blood with LPS, so the stuff that leaks through the leaky gut. And people with stress and uh, depression, anxiety, had higher immune cell reactivity to LPS than their healthy controls. That doesn't tell us we necessarily know how to treat it, but at least gives us a, a starting point to say, if you're stressed about your diet, you might actually be making yourself more reactive to said foods. Correct. So not that we're ignoring how you're feeling, but one of the things I think we probably both do is we'll sometimes supplant health research with a walk in nature. Yes. And that can go so far in terms of just getting you off of the hamster wheel of worry and research and mechanism and, ooh, it might be this thing instead of that thing and just get some outside, get some more parasympathetic. And we know there's a tremendous amount of healing that occurs with the limbic system or rebalancing when people spend time in nature. Yeah. I always like to say that nutrition is about growth metabolism and repair. And growth metabolism and repair don't just happen through food. So to your point, there are so many other areas that we can look at in dietary and lifestyle modifications that really do help us in the healing process. And when we're hyper fixated on the diet as the cure, I think we, again, have left behind so much. We've left so much on the table that can be supportive. Yep. Agreed. Agreed. Let's chat on lab tests. Um, Maybe we start with thyroid. Yeah. Since this is something that we we both speak about. And I'm not sure if we've had a discussion on 
the level of misdiagnosis of hypothyroidism and, and how that's getting a little we bit out of hand. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, let me throw you my few tidbits on this, my few thoughts, and then you can let me know what you agree with and what you don't and maybe why not. There was a really pivotal meta-analysis from a few years back in thyroid that found 37.2% of people who were on thyroid medication were essentially misdiagnosed. They could stop their medication, maintain normal thyroid levels, and there was no appreciable change in their symptoms. So I look at that in conjunction with some of the functional medicine lab ranges that seem to be getting narrower and narrower and narrower, and therefore more and more people are diagnosed as hypothyroid as the perfect cause for why there's so many people who are being misdiagnosed. There's one small side caveat I should make, which is part of that misdiagnosis, so sure it does come from the functional medicine field in my view, part of it might be from pregnancy-associated hypothyroidism that's transient, yes. and the person just never went back and followed up with their prescriber to be taken off. So yes. that's something that may elude some people. So for women who were put on thyroid hormone when you were pregnant, realize that it is transient in some cases to be subclinical or overtly hypothyroid during pregnancy and then post-pregnancy that oftentimes clears so you want to do a follow-up. But with that one aside, I think a lot of this is coming from the ranges that are just so narrow. But uh, what's your experience? Yeah, I love the perspective you're bringing here. And, and um, I'm going to even go a little broader. I love the Amelia Earhart quote, you haven't seen a tree until you've seen its shadow from the sky, right? So for me, <laughs> context is always key. And I want to say that in terms of labs, and sorry, I'm going broad to get to the thyroid. I will no, get fine. there. Yeah, yeah. But um, the broadness for me is in which labs I favor. And I favor serum labs. And there's a certain way I look at serum labs. So yes, one way is that functional versus pathological, seeing through those different lenses and what might that tell us. But the second way I'm looking at labs is through the trend versus the determinant. So how do I look at some markers over time and what's the story that that trend tells me? So I don't right. need to look at 20 years, but I can look at three years. I can look at five sure. years. I can look at one year if they're getting labs often enough. The third way, so functional versus pathological, yes, but where do we have questions there? trends versus determinants, and then what I call constellations. So what do other markers tell me is going on in the body at the gross level, when I'm talking about serum levels, gross level, what do other markers tell me that might tell me, in this case, something about the thyroid, right? So what does the uh, CBC tell me? What does the lipid panel tell me? How do these things work together physiologically that helps me to paint a picture that directs my attention? Because like you're saying, not only can people be misdiagnosed, but I think in addition to that, we don't understand how to look at the whole picture. Is this autoimmune or not autoimmune? Is it hypothyroid? Is it secondary hypothyroid? Is there something going on elsewhere that might be manifesting in the thyroid that if I focus there upstream, I can make a difference in the thyroid and then see a difference in the treatment and the recommendations. And then it becomes right. my job to see what we can do in that scope where we change the markers and then that's what's brought to the prescribing physician to say, wait yeah. a minute, maybe we don't need this or the patient being able to advocate and saying, can I try a taper here, right? So I think that yeah. the, the constellation is often something that's often missing in addition to um, how we're looking at functional versus uh, the pathological. I love that because as an ex example, using a few, a few specifics, if someone did have a mild elevation of their TPO antibodies, so let's say with the cutoff being 35, let's say they were 150. Now, in yes. my view, that's nothing to be worried about, but that could be one data point along with a TSH of 5.5. And they go to the wrong provider and the provider says, your hypothyroid, which I think is vastly incorrect to say a TSH of 5.5 is hypothyroid, but without going too into those weeds, and you have Hashimoto's, we need to start you on medication. And they overlook the fact that selenium, myonositol, vitamin D, as, as I know you know, and even recently, 
a better impact on TPO antibodies with red light therapy to the thyroid gland than even vitamin E, selenium, and myonositol. So we could pair those together, a diet rich in those nutrients, plus perhaps some supplemental versions of that, plus red light, and then see what happens to their labs in another few months. And that could- Exactly. And it's, it's been shown to reduce antibodies, reduce TSH, and that could stop someone from needing to be on lifelong thyroid hormone. And stress and lack of sleep and changes in the cycle and the timing of the cycle in which the lab was run. And that's to me why that constellation and that trend is necessary. What else do I see outside of the thyroid instead of hyperfixating on the thyroid? And before I bring in a prescription, can I see a trend that helps me to understand this better because that lab marker is just a moment in time. And I'm going to take yeah. that moment in time seriously, but this is where tracking, and I love lab trackers, where I can really tell a story for patients. And there's something I want to say that I learned in the, uh, the, the uh, case study group that I held for the book I'm writing that does integrate narrative medicine, is that people are really fearful of their labs. They're looking for the thing that is broken about them. Yeah. So what I started to show them is all the ways in which their body is functional and all the green lights, all the areas in which, wow, look how good your body is functioning for you. That starts to shift that story of I'm broken and I'm looking for a fix. Then we From can nocebo see, to placebo. Yeah, I yes, love that. Yes, totally. And I, I, I think it surprised me that people were so fearful because I'm not fearful. For me, the, my labs are a data point that I continue to track. My 23-year-old son like teases me. He's like, why do I have to do my labs every year? Who does this? And I'm like, do you know how much <laughs> people would pay me to look at their labs every year? <laughs> <laughs> That's kids, Just right? Just take it. Yeah. Just go with right. it. But I think that I realized the fear of people thinking something's going to be really wrong. And then where we could paint a picture of, look, this all comes back to blood sugar balance. I love this. This is a story. You're eating a paleo diet, but you're eating a lot of paleo junk food. Like, what are right. you eating for breakfast? You're eating that paleo cereal. Let's change that and see how you feel during the day and see what we can shift, right? Like if there's a bigger story there that allows us to also experience results and not be so fearful. Because the truth is, even though the people that you and I are seeing have chronic health challenges, their bodies are more functional than they're not, which is why they're coming to us, which is why Love they're it. telling us all these stories. They're not yep. hospitalized. They're coming to yeah. us. They're yeah. working. It's working for them in more ways than not. Mm. And I really appreciate, I'm going to partially steal and integrate that perspective of sort of flipping the valence of how we interpret the labs to be more positive. And I, I agree wholeheartedly that the field has a real problem with looking for anything that's a little bit out of balance and I'm sure you've seen this, someone comes in, even in their paperwork, what are your diagnoses? Leaky gut, IBS, SIBO, candida, mold toxicity, MTHFR, COMT. Exactly. And it's like, whole, like most of these labs mean almost nothing, nothing to begin with. But now you're walking around thinking you have seven, eight, nine diagnoses, Correct. which can be so toxic. So we could flip that and maybe say, well, this SIBO is actually super mild, which many cases are, you know, you're just over the cutoff. So shouldn't be too hard to support you back into balance and, and really flip it. I love that. Yeah, it really does a world of difference. And I think, yeah. um, you know, I just listened to a podcast that's called Hysterical and it's about mass psychogenic illness. And this is tricky because we don't want to gaslight our patients into uh, thinking that what they're not experiencing isn't real. It is. It is real. It's happening in your body. Whatever you're experiencing is 100% your truth. But I think that these functional diagnoses that we're anchoring on a lot of the times become this story that we're telling ourselves that we can't heal from. And again, getting out, I'm not saying it's simple, but oftentimes it is that simplicity on the other side of complexity, getting out in nature, hydrating. I see people who are anemic and I'm like, are you, I can look at their full lab work and say, 
are you hydrating? Did you drink water before your labs? And they're walking around with a diagnosis that they're then saying, I'm tired because I'm anemic and I have to do X, Y, and Z. And they're not hydrating. And yeah. really being able to come back to some of these things before we go into this complication does a world of difference. Yeah, it does seem that for certain personality types, there's sort of this limbic system fear avoidance pull toward reductionistic pathologizing of their symptoms. And I get that because it's a harm reduction mechanism. But if it's not checked and sort of recontextualized, and even worse, if it's leveraged by a healthcare provider, that can do a lot of damage. So yeah, obviously we're on the same page here. I don't want to beat that horse to death, but I think it is important because for some people, that can be a 30% plus bump in how they feel as soon as that conversation has been had. Absolutely. And there, there are a lot of medically unexplained symptoms. There are a lot of contested illnesses. These all fall into the realm of chronic health challenges and they are real. And yet we're trying to put a label on them and then we're over fixating on that label. And like you said at the start, there's a conflation of a lot of different things. And if we can pull that apart, that's where we're going to see the most results. If we're chasing that diagnostic, we're going to be constantly chasing. And this is what I see. I'm sure you do too. People have been on this path for years, chasing the next pill, the next protocol, the next provider. They've spent so much money. They're angry, uh, understandably, because they haven't been heard and they haven't been helped. And the help is different than what is often prescribed. Absolutely. And those can sometimes be the most challenging patients because now they're angry. Yes. And coming back to my earlier analogy or example of the person who's expecting that home run out of the gate, and if they don't get it, they're going to go see someone else. And it's challenging because the person wants to feel well and they're thinking, well, Rujo didn't get it or Nakayama didn't get it right out of the gate. So I'm going to go to somebody else. And I, yes. I get that, especially if you've been burnt. If you had an experience where someone didn't listen, they sent you home with a stack of lab kits and now you're $5,000 in at the first visit, let's say. Stack yeah, of and labs. Yeah. And you feel like you didn't get anywhere. You feel more broken than when you started because you have all these diagnoses now, but you treat the diagnoses, you don't feel any better. So I understand the frustration. Uh, but nevertheless... Clinicians, even the best clinicians, aren't magicians. And so if you if you have trust, give them some time. And if you're not sure, and I've also been there, right, where I said to myself, oh, you know, I, I don't feel like we're on the right track. But that's to be brought back to your provider and then to discuss that. And, you know, let me make the case, like I was saying, collect your thoughts before the visit, try to make it cogent, and help the clinician get to that aha where, oh, you know what? Maybe this isn't a bacterial issue because you're getting worse, let's say, from rifaximin. Yes. Maybe it's more so a fungal issue that we couldn't quantify, but now we have really valuable data leading us in that direction. Yes, and I think this is so important. And the thing I want to say to this patient, because I see them so clearly, is that when you're in the weeds, there needs to be somebody who's there with you and you need help seeing that forest through the trees, but yeah. only you can help them see that. And that is a process. So one thing I've said to these patients is, look, this is the process it's going to need to go through, whether you do it with me or someone else. If there was a quick fix, you would have already found it already. And so you've done so much, you would have found it. We have to take a different approach. It's going to be slow. It's going to be steady. I may be addressing some of the things that you think you've already addressed because we have to clear the muddy waters and see more clearly, and we need to do that together. And I think that therapeutic partnership is really, really key, and that's not what's happening in a lot of care today. Yep, agreed. And an analogy flashed into my mind, which is if you're on a ship, at least the old ships where I had the crow's nest, where the guy climbed up the, exactly. you know, the mast and could get a really big picture view, your healthcare provider helps provide that. So together you steer the ship, but one yes. of those in absence of the other and you're going to crash or go off course. Yeah. I mean, one of the areas I'm seeing this a lot right now, and I don't know if you are, I, the talk about perimenopause and menopause is up. And I'm 58, so, you know, I'm postmenopausal, but the talk is 
really, really, really hot right now. But the mm. talk is all about certain testing and certain <laughs> uh, therapeutics, right? Like, so I'm not anti-hormone testing. I think there's a place and a time for it. And I look at it very differently than others do because I'm looking at the internal mechanisms versus the, and the metabolization of hormones versus hormone therapy. But the drive towards hormone therapy right now is extreme. And people think it's another quick fix. And hormone therapy is complicated and very, very unique. And I, I just want to say that because I feel like it's a, it's the next wave. You and I have been in the field for a long time. And so we've seen the different waves of the diagnosis du jour, the testing du jour. We could look at how prevalent uh, genomic testing and people coming in with MTHFR or COMT like it was a diagnosis, like that turn, that ship has turned. Like we've seen all of these things. And right now I feel like one of the du jour uh, diagnoses and treatments is around menopause and hormone therapy. And I just want to like issue a caution for us to slow down all of it. Even when the recommendations come into place, titrate, singular, we have to be in that process with ourselves of that road to A to B. And we can't see clearly when we do too much at once. Yeah, I've always, I agree. And I've always said that if you put hormones into an inflamed body, they're probably not going to do what you want them to do. I do think it's great that more awareness of female hormone imbalances is making its way to the forefront. And this is something that Dr. Antonio Bianco and I discussed on the podcast a while back. And him being the former president of the ATA, the American Thyroid Association, he's pretty well suited to comment. And his comment was, there's definitely a subset of people who think they have hypothyroidism, where it's menopausal or female hormone imbalances and non-menopausal women that are driving the symptoms. And then I interpret that as well, diet, stress, gut, huge impact. And then we have these wonderful herbs, black cohosh, chase tree, dong kwai, that can be corrective. So we don't need the testing because they're adaptogenic. Uh, so I'm happy there's more awareness. And I think I maybe we can, we can bring a more holistic approach to how we support those needs. Thousand percent. Well, the w last thing I wanted to just see, I think we had a lot of this already, but symptom tracking. We touched on that earlier. We kind of earmarked it to come back to. Are there any inventories? I believe you have a fungal questionnaire, as do we, and, and I'm finding a lot of utility in that. We're trying to develop one for histamine intolerance. The challenge with the histamine intolerance questionnaire is right now coming from Afrin and Dempsey and sort of that cohort who diagnosed MCAS, the challenge is it has a lot of historical risk factors and lab tests that quantify the score, and those won't change over time, right? So I know actually Dempsey, to her credit, they're working on a consolidation of symptoms that are more so, or of, of questions that are more so symptom-based. So that might be another inventory to add of uh, symptoms to the lot here. But what symptom trackers are you using and you know what other tools tips or tricks do you have for people here? Yeah, so definitely tracking is in that art of the practice. Assess, recommend, track. And we're using all sorts of trackers, whether it's the lab tracker or a symptom tracker or a, uh, you know, a, a yeast questionnaire for fungal um, symptoms. But then we're really using the matrix to track what it is that we're seeing and put things, group things together so that we could be addressing more holistically or working with a partner like you for further diagnostics that might be needed for what we're seeing as a cluster of symptoms. So we're really banking on what do we see, what's the extreme, and then that micro timelining that I talked about. So again, slightly different in the scope that I'm talking into here because it's not not putting a diagnostic label on it, but it's honoring the symptom that the individual is experiencing and how we can put some color to it or texture in terms of what makes it better, what makes it worse is, oh, I notice like things like it's um, exacerbated when I'm cycling or on days that I'm stressed or when I drink coffee or I didn't sleep last night. Like 
how do we bring that texture to it so that when they come to their physician, there's more information for knowing what the appropriate next step testing, diagnostic testing might be. So a lot of tracking and a lot of capturing of data. So as I like to say, we need to separate the problem from the solution. When we put a diagnostic on it, we think we have the solution. And I'm sitting in the query of how do we spend time in identifying what the problem actually is and right. clear those muddy waters so we can even see more clearly. Then where do we need to get to some diagnostics? And sometimes the diagnostics come first because the person comes in with the diagnostics and that makes its way into the picture as well. So sometimes I feel like I'm speaking in tongues when I talk <laughs> this way because we're such a diagnostic culture but it really is just a different way of getting to the same results yep. that puts more yep. empowerment into the patient's hands because there's a lot that happens in the time between your doctor's visits. Sure. And speaking to the diagnostic culture, there there is an elephant in the room here that I, I try to repeat every once in a while. People want to have a diagnosis. Yes. They do. They want to be able to blame a thing. Yes. But something that's not discussed enough is many of these tests in functional medicine, I'm not saying all tests, I'm not saying your blood sugar and, and your blood pressure, but many of these functional tests, like a stool candida test, let's say, is one specific example, they may have a fair degree of false positives. Yes. And why that's so challenging is you could spend months treating a false positive and you're very likely not going to improve. Correct. Sometimes you get worse, so you spend months of time and resources for nothing if you treat a false positive. So Correct. this is why I think we're in such agreement that we look at this mosaic of their timeline, their symptoms, their prior response to diets and treatments, their lab testing, and all those build a case of probability, right? The yes. probability of this, this, or this, where we're going to go with a thing that's the highest probability and not just say, well, that's dual candida. Case yes. closed. That's what we're exactly. going to do. Exactly. And another example of this that's really important to me, and I wrote a two-part article on how you can't biohack your health, right? And <laughs> if people are health optimizing, more power to them. That's a different right. audience than I'm speaking to. If you're just like tweaking things and you feel great, awesome. Go biohack sure. till the cows come home. <laughs> but when we're using things, even glucose monitoring, we're not recognizing what the other factors are that are at play. So a lot of people are doing self-glucose monitoring now and continuous glucose monitors, and I am not opposed to those. I just think we have to recognize what the data is related to. And this is another one of those areas. As a nutritionist, I'm going to say people start blaming the food. And it's not just the food. It could be the stress of the day or the lack of sleep or the food combination or when was the last time you ate. And so uh, we're putting diagnostics in the hands of the patient in a way that lacks that context that we're talking about from the ship or from Great the airplane point. that we can see. And so collect the data, but don't analyze it for yourself because like you're saying, it could take us down the wrong path that leads us to more limitation, more over-identification, and ultimately more stress. Yep. Well said. And I, I love having these conversations because we are really against the headwind of yes. a field where there's so much messaging from lab companies and supplement companies, which again, have their time in their place and they can be helpful, but there's just such a predominance. I mean, some of these big companies literally pay marketing teams exactly. to market their tests. And so it's just the, just like pharmaceuticals. It's a, it's a good exactly. example, right? There's just yes. an army of reps out there trying to educate doctors. That same thing is happening in this space. And so hopefully this provides a, a countervailing narrative for people. If they're still to here, if you're still listening. Balance. Yeah, if they're not asleep or if they're not gone. <laughs> um, <laughs> is there anything that you've been working on that you want to make people aware of or any, any sort of closing thoughts you want to share with people? Yeah, thank you. I love this conversation as well. And I think it's really important. So I really appreciate being able to have it with you. I know how aligned we are. 
The work I'm doing over at AndreaNakayama.com, my personal website, that is geared towards more of these deeper conversations. And there's always a little narrative medicine prompt in there in my writing, even though it might be deeper about biohacking or evidence-based medicine or narrative medicine, opportunities to feel into our personal realities. I'm also aiming to offer free narrative medicine workshops once a month to see how this lands with the patient. And I have, I've Hmm. had great success. It's really fun. They're really moving and deep. And the tip that I want to give to folks that I'm really focused on right now is what moves you when we watch a movie or we have a conversation or we um, engage with something that we feel deeply, sit in that feeling. That feeling has a lot to tell us and it has a lot to tell us about ourselves. And there's a lot of um, positive chemicals in that feeling of being moved that are part of our healing trajectory. So I just think there's a different approach we can take to this. And that work is exploring that more ethereal world a little bit that comes back to our personal narratives and stories. Well, I'm glad people have that as a resource because we try to speak to that in the clinic, but there's only so much that we can do. And this is why it's a beautiful continuum that together we really hopefully cover all the bases. Thank you so much. You're welcome. It was a great chat and I'll look forward to the next one. 